All right, so I will give uh, an introduction to uh, invariant theory. So let me first give uh, an overview of what I'm going to talk about. So first I will talk about uh, invariants very generally. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to talk about a specific example as a motivation. Uh, namely, this is a very classical example of binary forms that was studied in the 19th century. And then uh, we'll start with the more formal setup. So then I'll talk about uh, polynomial rings and ideals in polynomial rings. And uh, then we'll talk about uh, invariant rings. And uh, then we'll talk about some uh, specific results in invariant theory. Um, <coughs> Now let me start by saying that uh, an invariant, like in the most general way, you can think of an invariant as something, some quantity or expression that's, that stays the same under some, some kind of transformations, okay? Some kind of, uh, some operations. So, for example, uh, in physics, uh, if you take the total energy of some system, that stays the same over time, you could say, well, that's, that's an invariant. Um, another example, uh, oops, how did, wait. Uh, the, the problem is here that the, that screen is not the same as this screen. Sorry? Uh, yeah, th this screen is the same as this one. Okay, so I'll just look at this. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know how that happens, but uh, yeah. So, so the total energy, okay, we already talked about that. Another example is uh, uh, if you want to prove uh, the correctness of some uh, algorithm, then one uh, method is using a loop invariant. There's some quantity or some expression that stays the same if you iterate uh, in the loop, and so that's another example of uh, another application of invariance. And that's also uh, the not invariance, so, uh, so the famous not invariance such as uh, the uh, Jones polynomial and Vasiliev invariance and various things, and they can be used, you know, you may have like two pictures of, of uh, knots, so two two-dimensional projections of some not, and you want to know, are these, in fact, the same not in, in the sense that you can transform one into the other? And um, you can use not invariants to uh, distinguish them in some cases. So, for example, if you use the, the Jones polynomial, then you can evaluate this, some, uh, the Jones polynomial on this not, and you get something here. And uh, you evaluate it on this, and you get something here. And this Jones polynomial uh, stays the same under all, you know, operations that you can use to go from one knot to another. So, uh, in particular, this shows that these knots are not equivalent. Okay, and so there's sort of a small, every, uh, there's sort of these randomized moves that, that allow you to go from one knot to another. So these are the allowable operations, but uh, <coughs> the not invariants are invariant under that. So that's another example of, uh, so there are many examples of invariants. But when, when I talk about, uh, well, another example of invariant is uh, homology and cohomology groups. So if you have topological manifolds, then you can sometimes distinguish them by uh, calculating the homology, and you can think of those as also uh, invariants. But when we talk about invariant theory, then uh, I always think about, well, we are in a more restrictive situation. So, um, so the uh, invariants that we will consider in this talk will be polynomial functions on the vector space. And uh, we look at polynomial functions that are, remain unchanged under group symmetries. So, so these are very 
special operations, where the operations basically come from a group action. So, uh, and in particular, we will look at, at the situation where the group acts on the vector space by linear transformations. In other words, we're looking at the case where, where the vector space is a representation of, of the group. So let's start with an example from uh, 19th century invariant theory, namely binary forms. So a binary form is just a uh, polynomial in two variables. And in this case, a binary form of degree two is just a polynomial in two variables that's homogeneous uh, of degree two, okay? Um, and now we have a group, SL2, so these are all two by two matrices with determinant one, and SL2 acts in the most natural way on uh, two-dimensional space by chains of coordinates. But SL2 also acts on, on a set of uh, binary forms of degree two, or, or more generally, binary forms of degree D. Uh, so what we could do is, if you have a polynomial in two variables, then we can use the substitution. So we can use uh, the matrix, so let's say take the matrix A, B, C, D, and we can use that as a substitution here. I'll make the following, so you can think of this as sort of right multiplication with this matrix for a row vector. And if we make this substitution, then we get another polynomial, okay? So we start with one polynomial and we use some substitution using some matrix and now we get another polynomial with different coefficients. So now we can sort of study like how does the polynomial actually change? Um, oh, see, look there. Uh, so if you have a, if this is the matrix, then the, the new coefficients are related to the old coefficients by uh, actually multiplying with this matrix. So there's some kind of uh, bigger matrix. And so this transformation is again a linear transformation from, so if we identify binary forms of degree two with uh, three dimensional vectors, so we just identify the, the form with its coefficients. So then the three coefficients. So then, uh, this is the transformation that we get. So you know, sometimes we can think of this as we start with the matrix and then to this matrix we can associate another matrix. And it turns out that this here uh, is actually a uh, representation of SL2. So uh, in, in Peter's talk, we had this map uh, row that sends a matrix to some other matrix uh, or that, set, that uh, is a map from a group to GL uh, N. And so in this case, we have a map from SL2 to uh, GL3. In fact, it will be SL3 actually, but okay. So in this case, we have an invariant, uh, which is the following. Uh, you can take the uh, so-called, well, so you maybe recognize this polynomial as uh, the discriminant. So uh, <clears throat> if instead of uh, P1, P2, P3, we think of the coefficients as um, indeterminates, x1, x2, x3, say, then uh, we can look at this polynomial x2 square minus 4, x1, x3, and we can evaluate it at the, f the coefficients of the first polynomial, the original polynomial, and we can evaluate it at the coefficients of the uh, new polynomial that we got by applying this matrix. And it turns out it's the same, so you can actually just do the calculation. And so this discriminant is something that's uh, invariant. And maybe not so surprising, right? Because the discriminant, you know, for example, if the left hand side is zero, that means that this uh, polynomial uh, had a, a double root, and then after substitution, then it will still have a double root. So maybe not surprising that this will give you some uh, invariant. Now this is not the only invariant, because obviously if you have f, 
then, so well, let me first, uh, okay, so we say that this F is an invariant under the action of SL2. So if we apply some element of SL2 to the polynomial, then this value of F doesn't change. And this is not the only, because, only invariant because we can always take a polynomial and we take, say, the square of it, and then that's also an invariant. So, but, but in some sense, it's, it's a, well, a fundamental invariant, and with that, we mean that every other invariant, if I have any other invariant polynomial in the coefficients, then I can express it in this F as follows. I can uh, think of it, uh, write it as a polynomial in this polynomial F. Okay, so that we call it a fundamental invariant. So essentially, if, if you know what the uh, discriminant is, you basically know what all invariants are. Okay. Now we can just do this for arbitrary degree, of course. So we can look at the polynomials of degree n. Uh, then we get n plus one coefficients, and we can identify such a polynomial with a vector, with an n plus one dimensional vector. And what we get then is that this SL2 will act on C n plus 1, and so this gives us an n plus 1 dimensional representation of SL2. In fact, this way we can actually get all irreducible representations of SL2. So if you take n running from 0 to infinity, then, then actually we get all irreducible representations. Uh, so this was uh, studied uh, in the 19th century a lot uh, uh, by, by a lot of people that I mentioned here. I think it started with Boole, but then a lot of other people, uh, some that I don't mention here. Uh, one of the highlights is this theorem of Gordon uh, that says that if you look at binary forms of degree D for arbitrary D, then there is always a finite system of fundamental invariants. So in the one example, there was just one fundamental invariance. But more generally, you may need more fundamental invariants. But there's a finite list of fundamental invariants such that every other invariance can be written as a polynomial uh, expression in the fundamental invariance. <clears throat> so that was a very, uh, that was a, a breakthrough. And uh, uh, a lot of uh, mathematicians have tried to actually calculate the uh, you know, systems of fundamental invariance for binary forms of degree D. Um, and um, actually, I think at the moment, such uh, systems are known for D at most 10. So th this problem actually becomes uh, complicated quite quickly, so. All right, so let, let's now start with a formal uh, setup. So um, we have uh, an n-dimensional vector space, and um, we can think of x1 up to xn, let these be the coordinate functions. And a, a polynomial can be viewed as, uh, if you have a polynomial, sort of a formal <laughs> polynomial, then we can also think of it as a function on CN, so a polynomial function. And uh, the set of all polynomials, we use this notation for that, and sometimes I abbrev X, use this abbreviation X for X1 up to XN. And it's actually a graded ring, and you know, it's a ring, meaning you, know, you can add, multiply, and subtract, and so on. Um, and let me just recall the definition of an ideal so an ideal, in this case, an ideal in the uh, polynomial ring is just, uh, well, it's a, a subset that contains zero and it's closed under addition, and it's closed under multiplication with something in the polynomial ring. Right. Um, and one uh, particular example of uh, an ideal is the ideal generated by some finite set so if you have a finite uh, set, subset of the polynomial ring, then the ideal generated by that set is just all possible combinations where uh, the fi's lie in the set and 
the AIs uh, just are polynomials, then it's easy to see that this uh, is actually an ideal. So this is the ideal generated by S. <clears throat> so Hilbert proved this theorem uh, that every ideal in the polynomial ring is finally generated, so ge generated by finitely many polynomials. Okay. And this paper in 1890, this was a, a paper on invariant theory, but he uses this uh, theorem actually to prove some statement about invariant theory. So nowadays we'd say, well, the polynomial ring is Noetherian. So Noetherian just means that in this ring, every ideal is finally generated. <clears throat> and if you think about it, then uh, this theorem actually also implies something that seems to be stronger. Namely, if I have any set, any subset of the polynomial ring, then not only is the ideal generated by S finally generated, but I can choose those generators from a finite subset of S. And so uh, Hilbert used this uh, to prove with the finiteness theorem, uh, which is a generalization of uh, the theorem of Cordon that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so <clears throat> group action. So in, the, in Peter's talk, we talked about, we uh, saw group actions and representations. So, uh, so in the, our setup, phi will be a, a, an n-dimensional representation of a group. So that means that we have some group G and every element in G acts by some matrix. So I, I used notation mg in my talk. Uh, in Peter's talk, he used rho of g, okay? But, um, and so then uh, the condition that this is a representation is uh, this, that, that if you take m of the product, then this is uh, equal to m of gh is equal to mg times mh. So th this matrix is a product of these two matrices and M of the identity element in the group is identity. And you can also see that from these properties follows that if you take M of the inverse, then this is the same as the inverse of MG, okay? Since inverses to inverses. Now, so, we, so uh, the group G acts on vector space V, but now G also acts on the polynomials on V. Right, the polynomial functions on V. So if I have a polynomial and I have some matrix, say n by n matrix, then instead of uh, the function f of V, we can just take m f of m V, right, where m is a linear, it's just a matrix. Then of course this is again a polynomial function. Uh, so you know, given by this formula here. Um, and so we can use this to uh, define an action of uh, the group G on the polynomial ring as follows, right? If G is an element in G and Fx is a polynomial, then we define a new polynomial G times F. So we think of this as sort of an action of G on, on the polynomial ring. Uh, and this polynomial is defined as follows, that uh, if we evaluate this polynomial on V, then it's just f of m g inverse v. And so again, uh, like in Peter's talk, it's not really so important why we put an inverse, but basically it's to, to make uh, the action of g on this polynomial ring to, uh, to make it a left action rather than a right action. But, and so like in Peter's talk, this polynomial ring, we can think of it as sort of uh, an infinite dimensional representation of g. So G acts on this polynomial ring, again by linear uh, transformation. But I should point out right, that this polynomial ring as a C-vector space is infinite dimensional, and the basis is given by all monomials, and there are infinitely many of those. And so G acts on, on this polynomial ring, and we can think of this as an infinite dimensional representation. Now if we restrict ourselves to one fixed degree, 
say, all homogeneous polynomial of a certain degree, then we get a finite dimensional representation. And in fact, uh, if you remember, that's basically exactly how we constructed the binary forms. All right. <clears throat> um, and so now we can look at all polynomials, all polynomial functions that are invariant under the group action on the polynomial ring. So we say that the polynomial is invariant if, uh, well, every element in G acts trivially on this polynomial. And uh, another way of saying it is you can easily see that this is equivalent if you look at the definition uh, of, uh, you know, if you look at the definition of this here. Now you see that this is equivalent to saying that a polynomial is a G invariant if and only if it's constant on, on all the G orbits. So that's sort of a more geometric way of looking at it. And so then the invariant ring, what we are interested in here, is the set of all G invariant polynomials in, in the polynomial ring. And this is a sub-algebra, so that just means that if you take uh, sums or products or differences of uh, invariant polynomials, then clearly those are again invariant. So, so just uh, so I mentioned, you know, ideal generated by polynomials. You can also talk about a sub-algebra generated by uh, some polynomials. So that's defined as follows. If you have some polynomials, then the algebra generated by these polynomials, which is notated, we use this notation, this is the set of all polynomial expressions in F1 up to FR. So P can be any polynomial in R variables. And you can see that this is a sub-algebra, right? It's again clearly closed under multiplication, subtractions, and addition and so on. So let's do uh, an example, which was also mentioned in Peter's talk. Uh, the symmetric group acts on Cn by, we can just let it act by permuting the coordinates. And one way of looking at this is if we take some permutation, then this acts by matrix, namely by a permutation matrix. So, uh, so you can define uh, some permutation matrix such that the action is exactly this permutation. And so this gives us an action of the symmetric group on the polynomial ring. And if you work it out, then this action is as follows. Uh, this uh, permutation acts on F by just permuting the variables here. And um, we can define the elementary semantic functions or polynomials as follows. You take all, uh, for some k, we take all products of k distinct monomials. And, sorry? Oh, yeah. uh, take the product of all uh, pro products of k distinct variables and you sum all those. And that gives you a polynomial that's clearly invariant under this, this uh, substitutions. So that's an invariant. So particularly the first elementary symmetric function is just the sum of all the variables. And the nth is the product of all the variables. And, and then all the other ones are sort of in between these two. And it's then well known that these invariants actually generate the invariant ring. Okay. So every uh, symmetric, so a symmetric polynomial is, uh, we say a polynomial is symmetric if, it, if it's just uh, invariant under this SN action. And so this invariant ring is the ring of symmetric polynomials and, every, and it's generated by these invariants. We don't necessarily have to take these invariants. I mean, the, the, so this is a system of fundamental invariants but, I mean, there are other systems of fundamental invariance that we could choose. One other uh, standard choice would be just to take the power sums. So instead of x, you can, may take this one, but then also x1 squared plus x2 squared up to xn squared. 
and you do it for all powers up to the nth power, they will also generate this invariant ring. Okay. Now for, um, now we get to the main result of uh, Hilbert, namely, uh, Again, uh, let, let's assume that this group G is reductive. Uh, and, and in my talk, I will just, for most of my talk, I will just work with the complex numbers. And what that then means is just that, that you know, every uh, representation is a direct sum of irreducible representation. Okay, so this was already, I think, defined in Peter's talk. And some examples of reductive groups are uh, GLN, SLN, orthogonal groups, symplectic groups, finite groups. Uh, uh, but also some groups, uh, like uh, Peter mentioned one group, the additive group, which is actually not reductive. But let's just say that G is reductive. Well then, <coughs> Hilbert, well I should say Hilbert didn't prove exactly this, because uh, Hilbert was uh, mostly looking at you know, special cases like GLN, SLN, ON, and so on, right? So this notion of reductive wasn't there yet, but, but essentially, if you look at this proof, it proves the following. If you have an invariant ring, then it's uh, for a reductive group, then it's finally generated. So uh, that, that means that there exist finally many polynomials, finally many invariants that generate this as a, an algebra. And so this is a, then a generalization of, uh, of Gordon's theorem. <clears throat> and let me just give you one proof, but well, not really, just a sketch. Uh, but I just want to show like, how this is related to this other result of Hilbert that every ideal is finally generated. So if we start with, we can start with the ideal generated by well, not all invariants, because then that would include one, but let's just take all homogeneous invariants that are not constant, okay? So that are infinitely many polynomials, and we take the ideal generated by that, okay? So a priori, that's an infinitely generated ideal, but by this uh, uh, Hilbert basis theorem, right, this, this theorem that this ideal is finally generated, we can actually choose finitely many invariants, uh, so finitely many from the set, so finitely many homogeneous non constant invariants that also generate this ideal. Okay? And then the third step, which I will not really explain, is then there's some induction proof that shows that those ideal generators are actually algebra generators for the invariant ring. Okay, and th this proof is not hard, um, but we do need, this is the part where we actually need that the group is reductive, because at some point we have to average over the group, right? And as Peter explained, uh, you can do this if the group is finite, or if the group is compact, or more generally, you, using this unitary trick, uh, if, if the group is reductive, then you can uh, also do this in some way. So, so that's basically the idea. So what I'm interested, what we're interested in here is also degree bounds. So, so this, this, this result of Hilbert actually uh, doesn't tell us really much in the sense that we know it's finally generated, but it doesn't tell you like how to find them. <clears throat> so one question we could ask is, you know, to which degree do we have to go to find these generators of the invariant ring? Um, and so for this, we define this beta of the invariant ring. This is the smallest d such that the invariant ring is generated by polynomials of degree at most d. So that means we only have to go up to degree d to find these generators. And so one question we would be interested in is, you know, to find upper bounds for this beta. Uh, <clears throat> so one sort of classical result was, uh, so after Gordon proved his finiteness uh, result for binary forms, uh, another mathematician, Jordan, uh, gave actually a degree bound. 
So uh, for binary forms of degree d, we only have to go up to degree d to power 6, which is actually not bad. I mean, it's still like polynomial, at least, in, in, uh, in d. <clears throat> Another result is uh, by Emmy Noether, which states that if g is a finite group, then uh, this beta is at most the group order. Um, there, are actually some more, there are actually some more results. Um, I mean, there's also a result by Weilau who proved uh, a nice bound for tori. Um, anyway. um, as I mentioned before, this, this theorem of Hilbert uh, doesn't really give you any degree bounds, or it doesn't even give you like an algorithm to find these uh, invariants. Right? In some sense, if you had if you had a degree bound, you would have an algorithm, right? Because uh, you can go degree by degree and uh, checking whether to finding invariants in this in uh, in one particular degree, you could uh, basically it would be just some linear algebra you could have to do. So in some sense, having an algorithm. Or, or degree bounds in some sense stronger than having an algorithm. But anyway, this Hilbert finalist theorem doesn't tell you anything because it just says, well, you know, there's some finite set of uh, generators, but it, up here it's not clear at all like where, where, where these, in which degrees those generators lie. You see that the methods of uh, Hilbert were completely different than those methods of Gordon, right? Because Gordon, the, these methods were just, you know, you, you start with some binary forms, you do some operations, you find some invariants, and you do some more, and, and you keep finding new invariants, and at some point you're done, okay? It's very explicit, you know, uh, so this, this, uh, <coughs> this result of Gordon is not just a, uh, the uh, statement, but it's actually really an algorithm. Um, but, but in fact, when, when Gordon saw this proof of Hilbert, well, Hilbert used all these fancy techniques that were sort of completely new, you know, this, and uh, well, then he said, like, you know, this is, uh, this is not mathematics, this is theology, because these were completely new methods, and basically, those papers of, uh, <clears throat> well, so, so uh, uh, a lot of these papers of Hilbert uh, well, the were sort of the foundation of, uh, sort of modern algebraic geometry. So it, it was sort of quite uh, a revolution. But anyway, so there was some criticism of Hilbert about, you know, this, this proof of his not being very constructive. So then he gave another proof that was more constructive. Uh, in some sense, it sort of gives an algorithm. It's still a little bit vague, and, you know, other people have sort of worked this out later in more detail. Uh, but in these two papers of 1890 and 1893, he uh, introduced many sort of important results. So I already mentioned that uh, the, the basis theorem that says the ideals are finally generated. In this paper, he also uh, proved the Null-Stellensatz, the famous Hilbert Null-Stellensatz, and uh, there are other results like finite free resolutions of ideals and Hilbert series and all kinds of things he introduced in these papers. Anyway, <clears throat> oh yeah, so, sorry, so, um, so this new constructive proof uh, is also much more geometric, okay? And so we'll talk now a little bit more about geometry, and in particular this notion of null, null cone. Uh, so that's for this reason I, I will talk a lot about uh, geometry now. And, and about the null cone in particular. So it's, it's related to this uh, constructive proof of Hilbert. And uh, it's also important for uh, you know, some of the applications in the complexity theory. 
So this is, will be very relevant to other talks in this uh, conference. Anyway, so if I have a, a vector v, then you know, g, this v is a representation of the group G, so then we can look at the orbit. And so this notation is the closure of the orbit. So that can be just, if we work with the complex numbers, we can just take the, the usual topology you know, for the complex numbers, or you can take this risky topology, if you know what that means. But, but in this case, it's actually the same thing. So there's a theorem that says that the orbit closures are, in fact, just, anyway. <clears throat> so, so we have the following fact that, uh, so ideally what we would have like to have is that uh, polynomials or the invariants would actually separate uh, all, um, all orbits, right? So if you think about, again, the problem of um, sort of, if you are sort of interested in the question, are two things, do two vectors lie in the same orbit, then one way of uh, uh, trying to uh, prove that two things don't lie in the same orbit is by apply, you know, evaluating invariance and seeing that they're not the same. So that's sort of the idea of not invariance, right? So ideally, your invariants are so strong that whenever two things don't lie in the same orbit, then the invariants will separate them. But, but in fact, that, that cannot always happen because uh, if it happens to be that if you take the orbit closures and they intersect non-trivially, then all the invariants would have to have the same value. So in other words, uh, even if V and W don't lie in the same orbit, if their orbit closures intersect, then they cannot be separated by invariance. Uh, but the converse is also true. So if, uh, if all invariants are the same on V and W, then that implies that the orbit closures have non-trivial intersection. So, so this theorem can also be proved using, for this is also important that G is reductive, otherwise this statement is not true. Uh, so this one direction is sort of clear. If you have an invariant, right, invariants are constant on the orbit, but invariants are also continuous functions. So uh, if they're constant on the orbit, they're also constant on the orbit closure. And so if these orbit closures are, if, if there's something, yeah, if these orbit closures intersect, then uh, that means that the f has to be constant on this and constant on that, and therefore the constant has to be the same on this union of these two orbit closures. In particular, f v has to be equal to f of w. The other implications are a little bit harder. Anyway. So now, <clears throat> so here's the definition of Hilbert's null cone. So it varies different, the different ways of defining it. So one way of defining it is just, we look at all the vectors such that the orbit closure contains the origin. Okay, so that's one definition. And what that sort of means is that, I could say that differently. I could say the orbit closure of V intersects with the orbit closure of zero because the orbit closure of zero is just zero. And then using this theorem, you see that this is the same as the set of all V for which F of V is equal to F of zero for all invariants. Or I can also say F of V is equal to zero for all uh, homogeneous invariants that are not constant. Uh, so another way, uh, you can also see that if, if we have generators of the invariant ring, say, let's say uh, these invariants are, say, homogeneous and non-constant, then the null cone is exactly uh, the set of all V for which these generators uh, vanish. Okay, so you, you can write it as, uh, so, so basically it's a zero set of finitely many polynomials here. May I ask a question? Yes. This here? 
Um, Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not claiming it's Hilbert's results, but uh, I mean, I sort of putting it. I mean, uh, Hilbert knew this. I'm pretty sure. So. so I don't know. Uh, yes, but I mean, I think probably did. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, but, but I mean, anyway. Yeah. Okay, let's do an example here. Um, let's take uh, uh, C star. So this is the multiplicative group, so uh, one-dimensional torus. Uh, and it acts on the four-dimensional space. So an element here acts by the following matrix. So remember that from the previous talk that uh, so the irreducible representations of C star are just one dimensional. Uh, so every representation can be sort of diagonalized. So uh, we can always choose some basis of C4 such that uh, this action will be sort of given by some diagonal matrix. Anyway, let's look, look at this example. So uh, an element T acts by this matrix MT and basically multiplies V1 and V2 by T and V3 and V4 by T inverse. And so now we can ask, you know, for which vectors does zero lie in the closure or orbit closure, right? Now you see if V3 and V4 are zero, so then these two will be zero, and then you can take the limit T goes to zero, then these will also go to zero. So if V3 and V4 are zero, then this will lie in the null cone. And similarly, if uh, V1 and V2 are zero, and you take T goes to infinity, then this will go to zero. So, so this also lies in the null cone. And for example, if V1 is non-zero and V3 is non-zero, then say this product here will be constant on the orbit and non-zero. So you can also see that in that case, it will not lie in the null cone. So this is, this is the null cone. So this is sort of a geometric argument looking at uh, all orbits that have zero in its closure. But we also saw this other definition of null cone. We can look at the generating invariance. So I, I'm not giving a proof of this, but the, the invariance that generate this uh, invariant ring are these, these four. So uh, yeah, I, I just mentioned that x1, x3 is uh, invariant. And, all these are sort of invariants. So then the null cone is the zero set of these generating invariants. And you can sort of see that if this is zero, then you're actually in this set, right? Anyway. Well, one more thing I would like to point out is uh, <coughs> often we have relations among the generators. So, uh, so this here, this ring is not a polynomial ring. I just want to point this out. Like if you take the product of this and this, then it's the same as the product of this and that. Okay. Nevertheless, we cannot really omit any uh, because otherwise they will not be, uh, they will not generate it as a, an algebra. Okay. So in some sense, this one is an irrational expression in these three, but not a polynomial expression. Okay. Yeah, so I also want to talk about the Hilbert Mumford criterion. So that's some uh, further geometric tool to understand the null cone. So a one parameter subgroup is a homomorphism of algebraic groups from uh, C star, the multiplicative group, to your group G. Okay, so. So this is uh, like continuous, but also a homomorphism of algebraic groups. Uh, so now we have the following criterion for the null cone. So a vector lies, a vector lies in the null cone if and only if there exists one parameter subgroup, so that if you take lambda of t applied to v, so this is a group element, and if you take the limit t goes to zero, 
then this will go to zero. So it is, in other words, if, if zero lies in the orbit closure, then we can actually achieve this in a very specific way using this one parameter subgroups. So one direction is clear, like from right to left, because uh, clearly these are elements in the group, so that means that zero lies in the, the orbit closure, but, but, but uh, the other direction is non-trivial. It says that if something is a null, lies in a null cone, there's a very specific way we can find zero as a, a limit of things in, in the orbit. So as an example of this hilbert mumford criterion, uh, let's look at the following example. Uh, so we look at uh, V to be the n by n matrices. So uh, in this case, it's an, a vector space of dimension n square, not n. Okay, so I'm cheating a little bit. But the group G acts on V by uh, conjugation. So if we have an invertible matrix, then it acts by conjugation on this uh, matrix. <clears throat> and so let's look at some specific um, one parameter subgroup. So, um, so we can just take some kind of diagonal form, uh, maybe choose also this ordering. So K1 up to Kn, these are say integers. So they can, yeah, these, these are integers. And so then we can up, take this lambda t, which is some invertible matrix acted on A. Then we get this matrix where each entry is uh, multiplied by some scalar, uh, depending on which i and j you looking at. And so then we can look at, you know, one is, when is this limit zero? Well, it means that whenever, let's see, when, Whenever this is non-zero, then uh, this should be uh, positive, right? So if, anyway, so if I'm not mistaken, that means that A has to be a strict upper triangular matrix. Or maybe you should say a strict upper triangular block matrix if you group together all the k's that are the same. But if, if, if it's strictly increasing, then the condition, this is equivalent to saying that A is strict upper triangular matrix. So if, uh, in particular, so that means that if you have a strict upper triangular matrix, then that will lie in a null cone, okay? And also, uh, now not every uh, one parameter subgroup is of this form. However, uh, it's actually true that every one parameter subgroup uh, is of this form after a change, after base change. Again, that sort of follows from the representation theory of C star, right? We can always diagonalize it with respect to some bases. Uh, and so that means that, um, so basically it means that uh, a matrix lies in a null cone if and only if it's conjugate to some strict upper triangular matrix. And that is equivalent to saying that A is null potent because you know perhaps from linear algebra if A is null potent then we can always find a basis such that it's in Jordan normal form, in particular it's upper triangular. And on the other hand if some a matrix is uh, upper, upper triangular after base change then clearly it has to be null potent if it's strict upper triangular. So, so this is equivalent. So the null cone here uh, uh, consists exactly of all null potent matrices. So this is a, sort of a nice description of the null cone in this example. Uh, another way of looking at it as, is in terms of invariance. So if you have a matrix, so let's just take sort of a, 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 a matrix where we just take indeterminates. So then we can look at the characteristic polynomial. I forgot to write it on the slide, but so, so this you may recognize as the characteristic polynomial of the matrix X. So this is a polynomial of degree N, and the coefficients now are polynomials in the entries, okay? So, uh, so F1 X up to Fn X, and in this case, X stands for X11 up to Xnn. 
So for example, F1 here is the trace of the matrix, Fn is the determinant of the matrix, and then there's some other things. There's actually some relation to the symmetric polynomials here. But. And so we know in this case that the invariant ring is actually generated by, by these coefficients here, by these, so these F1 up to Fn are uh, invariants. And so uh, we see that a matrix is nilpotent if and only if all these coefficients are equal to zero. So that's if and only if the characteristic polynomial is t to the power n. And again, from linear algebra, we know that the characteristic polynomial, right, if you, if you plug in the matrix in the characteristic polynomial, you always get zero by Cayley Hamilton. So in particular, if this is t to the power n, that means that a to the power n is equal to zero. And we also know that if A is nilpotent, then the characteristic polynomial must be T to the power N. Uh, again, if you write it as an upper triangular matrix, matrix, then you see that this determinant is just T to the power N. <clears throat> so again, we see that A is nilpotent if it only lies in the null cone, but now we see it from a different point of view. Okay. <clears throat> so now, I want to go back to uh, degree bounds for invariance. So as I mentioned, Hilbert used this null cone to find the constructive proof for his finiteness theorem. And so what he showed is the following. Okay, suppose, suppose we have invariance and um, the null cone is defined as the zero set of these invariants, okay? So it could be that these are generators of the invariant ring, but it doesn't have to be. So it could be that these don't generate the invariant ring, but still the zero set of these polynomials is the null cone. Now, if you're in that situation, then the sort of the following structure. So in that situation, these F1 up to Fr may not generate the invariant ring, but we get something, uh, well, let, let's just, uh, look at this. So uh, the statement is that there exists some finitely many invariants, so that every invariant can be written in the following form, basically a combination of this H1 up to Hs, where these, uh, these polynomials, the A's, are uh, polynomial expressions in these F1 up to Fr, okay? So every polynomial has a very specific form. And what we have in this case, so, so uh, in some sense, this H only appear linearly, right? And these Fs, they may appear in sort of any degree in this expression. That's one way of thinking about this. Um, so, so maybe. So in particular, uh, in this situation, uh, the ring of invariance is generated by F1 up to Fr and H1 up to Hs. If you throw all of them together, they will generate the invariant ring. Yes? Um, well, he used uh, null Stellenzatz. Um, and I guess also, <coughs> yeah, I, I think ma mainly the null Stellenzatz, really. Sorry? So I can't the operator. The operator. Yeah, um, he probably also needs a Reynolds operator. That, that I don't remember. Um, but, but this statement is, is actually also true in, in, uh, in, in some cases in positive characteristic. But, but we're, no, we're not really talking about that here now. 
Okay. Yeah, so I should say uh, Hilbert didn't really get any degree bounds. Um, so degree bounds were found later by Popov. And so, for example, one thing he showed, I mean, this is not the only thing he showed, but one crucial step what he proved is the following. Suppose we have invariants, just as before, that define a null cone, but let's assume they all have the same degree. Okay. Then, then we can say something stronger. Namely, uh, we can say something about the degrees of this H1 up to Hs. We can show that they have degree at most n times d minus 1. And the rest of the statement is sort of the same. So if, if we assume all these have the same degree, d, then, then we can have a degree bound for h1 up to hs. And in particular, we get a degree bound for the ring, generators of the ring of invariance. So uh, in particular, we can say it's at most n times d, where n is the dimension of the representation, and d is this d here. Okay. Now, what goes into this proof is, uh, on the one hand, uh, the Hochschild-Roberts theorem, which is a very deep theorem uh, that says that this invariant ring has sort of this nice property called uh, Cohen-Macaulay. Uh, and then uh, another thing that goes in there is uh, the Noether normalization lemma. Uh, and that basically says the following, okay? So we have, we have this uh, F1 up to Fr that define the null cone. But, but to, uh, to apply this uh, result of cone macauliness of this invariant ring, to make that useful, we want, we want fewer polynomials that define this null cone. So what we do is, uh, instead of taking F1 up to Fr, we can take some fewer polynomials that are sort of linear combinations of F1 up to Fr. And so the statement is, neutral normalization lemma says that uh, if, 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 uh, if you have the right number of uh, invariants, then you can choose them to be sort of linear combinations of F1 up to Fr, such that uh, those new polynomials still define a null cone. So you, you have it uh, as a zero set of fewer invariants. But these linear combinations that you have to choose, it's not so obvious how to choose them. In some sense, you have to choose them randomly, but of course, we try to avoid randomness, so, so that's sort of this thing of de-randomization. So maybe there will be more uh, uh, about this in Catan's uh, talk, but anyway. Uh, and then there's also uh, some statement about Hilbert series that you need to get this. So it's actually combining various uh, results to, to get this. And now the problem is also here that uh, you have this, ha have this F1 up to Fr, it should be of the same degree, okay? But usually, uh, if you try to find F1 up to Fr in some fashion, then often they will not be of the same degree. But if they're not of the same degree, then there's a trick to make them of the same degree, namely, you could replace every fi to some high power such that all of them are the same degree. And for uh, the zero set of them will not really matter, okay? The only problem is that, that, that if you do that, that the degrees of the f1 up to fr become very high, and then the, the degree bounds that you get will be much worse. So the thing is that instead of d, you may have here, uh, say, if all the fi's have a uh, degree at most d, then you would have to replace this d by d factorial because you have to go to degree d factorial to make all of them of the same degree. But actually, there was actually another way of around it. So, so I 